produced magazines in the libertarian movement. Uh, some, some of you may have seen the cover issue, which he's now holding up in his hand, uh, Decline of an Empire. This topic on which Mr. Friedlander is going to speak, uh, Pressure Points for Social Change and Futurism. Turn the floor over to Lonnie. Thank you, Gary. First, a couple questions. I'd like to find out where the people are from here. How many are new to libertarianism, say, within the last year? And before that, how many were on the left? Um, how many were liberals? Conservatives? Okay. Uh, how many were previously interested in politics? Can everyone hear me now? <sighs> okay. The talk I'm giving today is uh, not my own, but it's a talk by one of the other editors of Reason who is a think tank engineer and who for fun and profit uh, changes political systems out on the west coast. This firm has been involved in things like changing the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system in a uh, southern California county and uh, putting the public library on a profit basis uh, in another city. Things like this. So he's uh, actually making the changes that we've been talking about here. And the reason for delivering this speech is in the hopes to change the emphasis of the libertarian movement from a, an armchair kind of uh, movement to one where actual uh, our, our ideas are effectuated, uh, brought into existence. Not that the, um, that the, um, the theory isn't important, but um, it, this seems to be a movement primarily of, um, of philosopher kings. And um, there's a need for other things to happen. The left has been uh, at least moderately successful in changing America, and we should be too. We have better ideas, and they do work in the world, whereas uh, the liberal programs are falling apart. So uh, we should be particularly attractive right now. Oh. One person defined the libertarian movement as 800 people trading books, or selling books to each other, so we had to change that. It's now 1,600. Jared has the official figures. The only one getting rich out of that is Jared. Because he's selling the books. Okay, I'll get into futurism after the, um, after the lever point paper as soon as I see how long that takes. And um, you should keep in mind that these are Bob's proposals as a particular, uh, as a particular kind of professional. And uh, you don't have to, if he says that you should get into think tanks, that doesn't mean everyone. That means that you should just start thinking in the ways that he's talking about. Start thinking about, um, about where the pressure points are. You should keep in mind that pressure points are not something that everyone doesn't have to go and get Nixon elected. If you're a, a lawyer, something you could do is take a, a kind of a private survey of how many Supreme Court judges smoke grass. This kind of, any kind of different thing where you have an in. If you're in advertising, you have a particular place. Media, that was very beautiful, the, uh, the, the article in the New York Times. They happen to be in a really good position and they took, uh, took advantage of it. Okay, The Lever Points for Social Change by Robert Poole, copyright 1971. Can everyone hear? Uh, liberta libertarians dedicated to social change face what appears an insurmountable task. The number of people in the U.S. who can be considered libertarians may be approximated in the terms of, say, a few thousand serious students of, and academic... Acumen, acumen, uh, and uh, professors, 10 to 20,000 current subscribers to more or less libertarian publications. I don't know where that figure's from. And perhaps 100,000 who have had enough contact with libertarian, libertarian ideas to have gotten their names on a mailing list. So Brandon has the, 
seventy thousand. That's from the old NBI list. So, but whatever, whichever of these figures is the most meaningful, it's clear that uh, libertarians are uh, constitute at best an order of 005 percent. That's uh, not even a half a percent. That, that, that's one more decimal point, or roughly one in two thousand. Given such numerical weakness, the chances of convincing a majority of the people to vote to end all forms of coercion seem vanishingly small, at least in the foreseeable future. There is an assumption in this prognosis which needs to be made explicit, namely that the major problem with which libertarians must deal is political. Some may argue that the problems are fundamentally uh, psychopathological or or, um, or psychological or epistemological, and that you need to have rational people before you can have a free society. However, this is not totally the case. However, it's not necessarily the case. And furthermore, it's possible to make some changes right now, uh, given the level of rationality we have in the society. Okay, so with the proper reservations, the problem of social change may be viewed as primarily political as nature. And this is his, this is his opinion, right? And he's uh, in a slightly different context than I. I would think that it's much more epistemological, uh, much more, much more need for logic than than the political changes. But um, this is how he can operate. So uh, the libertarian's task then is to find ways to change the political structure from that of a monolithic state to a diverse, decentralized, contractual system <clears throat> in which rights are absolutely respected. While admittedly a minuscule minority, libertarians armed with a proper understanding of social processes can still possibly um, <clears throat> effectuate change. To see how this is so, we must learn how our political system works in fact as opposed to textbook theory. In theory, political policy is determined by our elective representatives who enact the expressed <laughs> desires of the majority. To effect substantial political change, therefore, requires that one convince a majority of the people and then see to it that, that they elect the proper candidate. But what actually happens in our political system isn't this. Can anyone believe that a groundswell of popular opinion led to the government's decision to finance the SST? Is the, is the public now clamoring for farm, farm subsidies and import quotas? And did the mass of the populace push Lyndon Johnson into the Vietnam War? In each case, the answer is no. Despite the democratic rhetoric and window dressing, our political system is basically elitist in nature. Virt, virt, virtually all of the basic discussion of problems, alternatives, and policy choice is accomplished not by the general public, nor even by Congress, but by a small group of people with specialized knowledge. By the time an issue, say the volunteer army, uh, government insurance, and board quotas reaches public awareness, most of the real battle has already been fought. The problem has been defined, often in a way which precludes any sort of non-governmental solution, and a limited set of alternatives has been drafted. By the time the, the representative body gets around to the subject, all that's left is to haggle over details of implementation rather than the, su the substance of the issue. The really cr crucial questions are decided by specialists over whom the electorate has little knowledge and no control. Who poses the questions and frames the alternatives? Some are the specialists who get appointed to presidential task forces and commissions, such as those in recent years dealing with crime, civil disorders, violence, the volunteer military, and pornography. Although usually prominent members of the establishment, appointees are sometimes include serious libertarians. Uh, an example would be, well, we, we knocked him today, but Milton Freeman and Alan Greenspan on the Volunteer Military Commission. The commission members get the bulk of the publicity, but it's often the, the uh, younger people who are hired as staff members who do the actual uh, the actual research and the general pro the proposals on which the older people base their conclusions. And the staff members are usually younger and have to be more idealistic 
and open to new ideas, more so than the commission members. Presidential, while presidential commissions get uh, most of the publicity, they're only a fraction of, su of the number of such groups in Washington, including congressional advisory groups and interagency committees. About 1,500 such bodies uh, exist at present. I wonder if, you know, how much this is, is discussed in the news. Very little. But this is all happening. It's just not the, um, the regulatory agencies anymore, but an immense number of outside firms. Okay, among the most important currently at work are the presidential, the President's Commission on School Finance, the Commission on Financial Regulation, National Commission on Population Growth, and the American Future, which I never heard of. The, uh, their conclusions could have important consequences on such significant matters as the future of education vouchers, which is now in effect, as a matter of fact, in a pilot program. Um, the uh, controls and privileges in banking and finance, and the government's restraints in sex uh, and marital customs. The actual impact of such commissions can be debated, and I have with a lot of people. Uh, the volunteer military commission's recommendations were favorably received and are slowly being implemented. Uh, I take this uh, that he knows the most about this, because um, I haven't seen that much. Whereas the Pornography Commission, uh, well, it was just ignored. Uh, still, the publicity and prestige of such reports transfers them into an integral part of the political um, intellectual scene, so that they actually become like the reason for getting Nixon elected was he was going to write a lot of good speeches, and this has the same kind of effect. But people will now hear that pornography isn't bad or that we need a voluntary uh, military. Okay, the second group of specialists is even less well known and probably more effective than the major commissions. This group consists of companies and institutions, institutes doing research and systems analysis into government functions and operations, and thor in short, the think tanks like the RAND Corporation, GE Tempo, Arthur D. Little, and so forth. Think tanks may be profit-making, non-profit-making, or subsidiaries of universities. But whatever their structure, they derive the bulk of their income in the same way by co carrying out research, pro research projects under contract, primarily from governments. Many of the think tanks got their start doing exclusively military operations research. Today, Nearly all have greatly expanded the scope of their interests and expertise, employing economists, political scientists, behavioral scientists, as well as managers, uh, engineers, systems analysts, and uh, physicists. Think tank engineers are being called upon to examine virtually every area of the economy and of government functions in order to analyze the nature and of the status quo and recommend improvements. For example, in the field of aviation, uh, the Transport Department, DOT, and NASA last year let contracts to a number of think tanks for far, a far-reaching study of the government's involve, involvement in their transportation. As you know, they're pretty well involved. Uh, some examples are Booz and Allen and Hamilton, which studied the historical benefits derived from their transportation. The Office of Public Studies of George Washington University studied the social impact of uh, transportation system, system patterns. Planning Research Corporation evaluate, evaluated the likely tech, technical and economic characteristics of future transportation systems. And Arthur D. Little examined who should finance and manage various aspects of the projected system. Basic to the entire study was to evaluate the impact in terms of sp specific costs and benefits of the present federal regulatory structure. After 18 months of study, the project summary report stressed the following recommendations. These are quotes. Removal of regulatory and antitrust legal restraints should be considered as a, a means of permitting transportation to extend into a door-to-door -door service rather than gate-to-gate. -gate. And marketing experiments should be considered to, to determine if there are any regions of the U.S where market characteristics might justify competing carriers to set rates freely and establish routes. And I guess that's in reference to CAB. 
and probably also to, um, to freight charges. Small hesitant steps towards laissez-faire? Certainly, but they are positive forward steps being proposed at the highest levels and being listened to. And I have in parentheses, not smoky rooms, smoky back rooms. Um, the preceding example illustrates the more conventional type of think tank study. In the last few years, however, think tanks have been del delving deeply into more basic and emotion-laden areas of government function. And this is this is really amazing. A recent listing of Rand Corporation studies in, in urban problems includes some provocative abstracts of projects, such as a, a thorough study of bureaus and bureaucrats analyzing, quote, the peculiar, peculiarities, the conflicting and complex motives of real bureaucrats, and classifying them into five categories based on their motivations and behavior patterns. Which, <laughs> um, a study of teacher shortages recommending salary schedules with subject matter pay differentials as opposed to the status seniority pay scale used in most public schools, which would be put uh, some of some of that back on the market. A study of 297 urban renewal projects documenting the fact that the project sharply reduced the land area devoted to residential use to make room for an industry and government buildings. And I think the, uh, the rationale behind that program was to provide housing for the poor. An analysis of hosp hospitalization insurance, insurance recommending a more market-oriented relationship between premiums and benefits, in quotations, of variable cost insurance. A study of a proposed government-owned rapid transit system for L.A., pointing out the exaggerated claims made for it, documenting that the cost would exceed the benefits, and they're doing this before the, the thing's finished, which is uh, quite a change from the typical situation. And uh, recommending alternatives such as subsidy of, quote, free entry taxi service for the present franchise type, which means that uh, the, the whole system would be gypsy taxis. And a study of alternative methods of dispensing social services, such as the individualized marketplace made possible by such devouchers as such devices as educational vouchers. One of the most important RAND studies is a comprehensive analysis of the renting, a rental housing market in New York City. One RAND paper, and he gives a, a reference, demonstrates that public construction and rehabilitation has have no effect on the long-run equilibrium quantity of housing. That's in quotes. That is, that the subsidizing effect of government construction activities causes a short-run increase in the demand for housing, but has no net effect on the total long-range supply. And uh, an in increase in demand for housing means that more poor people are coming in and uh, applying for welfare. Another paper, oh, uh, they're recommending, let's see, this let's see, has no net effect on the total long-range supply due to the behavior of buyers and sellers in response to the program. You know, what, has, uh, what have the free market economists been saying all along? And they're finding this out by going out and doing computer studies and, and tabulating everything that's happening out there. Another paper describes the effects of rent control. And this is really beautiful because you notice the rents are going up this year. They didn't, uh, didn't renew the, the thing. They're going up 15%. A simple rent control program results in a decrease in the quantity of housing service consumed in the long run. In the short run, renting control, uh, rent control hastens the, de hastens the deterioration of rent control housing and hence worsens the housing occupied by the tenants of these dwellings. It is further deduced that rent control subsidizes the consumption of non-housing goods by tenants of rent control units at the expense of the owners of these units, so they buy more groceries or whatever. Other related papers analyze the effects of property taxes on the operating and investment decisions of, of landlords and propose a voucher-type system, that is, rent certificates, for aiding low-income tenants as an alternative to rent control, which would be one step towards the marketplace. 
Uh, RAND is not the only think tank entering into politically sensitive areas. General Research is among the leaders in applying systems analysis method, systems analyst methods to the operations of law enforcement agencies, the court system, and the correction system, which I guess you'd be interested in. Um, the company is developing a computer simulation of the processing of people through the criminal justice system, which will make it possible for the first time to determine how costly and how effective it is to process various types of cases, which may lead to a re-examination of the A aims and methods of operation of the various components of the system. Up to now, they didn't really know how much it costs to process someone through the system. They may find out these things that it costs $10,000 to process a, a $2,000 uh, uh, theft. You know, amazing things. And uh, when money's so tight right now, that really becomes important. GE's uh, Tempo Center for Advanced Studies has applied systems and economic analysis to a variety of government activities. In one study, the concept of property rights as a market me mechanism for allocating the electromagnetic frequency spectrum was introduced and explored. This stuff's really amazing. These are, these are probably done by liberals who know nothing about Mises. Do you want to ask a question now? All right, um, this is going to appear in Reason in about two months, and there will be the footnotes, so you can check that and, and or write in a letter or something like that. You know, I'm not up on any All I know about these particular um, reports is what appears right here, except for the rent control situation, which I've heard something about through, through um, people who used to work for RAND. And there's another point. You can say, right, that maybe these don't have an effect, but you can, but that's not the only place the activity is taking place on. The uh, volunteer military can, uh, you know, they can slow down the, the um, advance of the volunteer military, you know, say it's not practical or anything like that, but you can still have resistance. You still have many other programs. If 100,000 kids were to uh, just simply not go into the draft board at the age of 18, the system would start falling apart in that way. So you have these different forces um, working in our direction. At the same time, we're getting more and more publicity uh, about the movement. So there are a lot of things happening. So um, keep that keep that as a context. This is his particular area. Another pioneering study, also the Temple, uh, considered ways in which airports could be run on a free market basis, utilizing landing fees both as a means of revenue and to reduce congestion by adjusting the price in accordance to the hourly demand, which means, you know, to come in at five o'clock, it would cost ten times more. And there, that's the end of your, um, air crisis. Or part of it, anyway. Rand has also analyzed this problem and has proposed essentially the same solution, proportional marginal cost pricing of landing, landing rights. There's an extremely important lesson for libertarians to learn in the above activities. <coughs> For years, libertarians have been reading Mises, Rothbard, Hayek, and so forth, and discovering how an unhampered market can work, how true economic calculation is impossible in the absence of a price structure, that the concept of property can be applied successfully to matters commonly thought of as public goods and free goods, or free goods. Libertarians have claimed that these concepts are rational, and that social and economic structures consistent with them are characterized by maximum efficiency in the use of resources. Yet despite all these claims, many libertarians, especially among those under 30, treat this knowledge as if it were an occult secret, capable of being understood only by a select few, and therefore consider themselves virtually an underground movement. And I wonder and, you know, how much the, the case on the East Coast that is, because this is written out in California. But it's true there. They put out their underground papers and kind of stuff. Yet, as the above think tank examples illustrate, since the ideas are rational and the hypothetical systems are the most efficient, these ideas can be communicated to persons outside the confines of the movement. And many such persons are discovering market ideas without the benefit of the movement, thanks to the idea's inherent validity. And I have a whole list of reading material 
that I'll just run through real quick, see how many people have read that, any of those things. These are people like radicals. There, there are now left-wingers who are free market, and I guess some people know about the free market uh, advocates, and there are liberals who are denouncing the public school system and then calling for, uh, for a private school system. And all kinds of strange things are happening now. Because all those programs they put into existence around 1965 or so, you know, that was the last hope, sort of, and they're just falling apart. And, and um, they're really doing some serious thinking instead of the, the, the old rhetoric of 65. You go back and look at those books and read them, and they look so dated now after reading this other material by the, by the latest people like John Holt on the public schools. Okay, um, additional light can be thrown on this underground syndrome by examining the rhetoric used by its spokesmen. Underground libertarians tend to view the world in terms of a rigid, two-valued logic. People are either, either quote, statists or, quote, libertarians, either good guys or bad guys, us or them. Bob says, this is a grossly undersimplified picture, even of federal and state governmental bureaucracies. These two terms are useful as concepts for de delineating fundamental opposite approaches to social problems, but to haphazardly apply them as black and white labels to, to individual people has the effect of erroneously defining why everybody but a small in-group. This may be emotionally satisfying, but it does not correspond to reality, as the experience of the think tanks demonstrate. Despite libertarian rhetoric about the predominant rationality of our times, which may be true in of limited areas such as ethics, logical thinking and rationality are very much in the in vogue in the areas of engineering, systems analyst, and applied, that is, real-world social sciences. What is not in vogue is ideology. An important difference needs to be drawn between the values, that is, ideology, underlying one's work, and the method of presentation and expression one chooses. It is quite acceptable and unavoidable for a think tank, think tank uh, systems analyst to have a value system which motivates his efforts and affects his choice of problems, emphasis, and so forth. It is not acceptable to present results in an ideological manner. It is unfortunately true that there, there is as yet in the intellectual and scientific community no recognition of the existence of a rational value structure. In parentheses, it is interesting to note that while some technical people refuse to consider such a possibility, others see a definite need for such a value structure, and he gets into that in a minute. For the most part, this is a constraint within one much must work if one is to be listened to. Thus, um, analysis and conclusions, although they may have been motivated by what one considers to be a rational, that is, objectivist, libertarian value structure, cannot be justified on that basis. They must be justifiable on their own merits as most efficient, cost-effective, and so forth. As pointed out above, if Austrian economic theory is in fact as rational as its proponents claim, there should be few problems doing this, assuming one is willing to work hard enough formulating problems, gathering and analyzing data, and so forth. The important point is that people will listen to rationally presented arguments based on demonstrable economic efficiency. We have seen, therefore, that there are two groups in our society with influence vastly out of proportion with their numbers, which are called upon to chart the course of the role of government in America, and these are the advisory commissions and think tanks. These groups, in a very real sense, may be determined, uh, termed lever points in which, in the sense that Archimedes had in mind, and give me a lever and I'll move the world. As such, they offer libertarians a means of vastly increasing their influence in shaping the, the, the future of society. Two questions arise at this point. First, can a small group of people sharing a common value system efficiently, efficiently place themselves in such positions of influence and utilize them in con concert? Secondly, what are the most promising organizations for U.S. libertarians to enter? The first question can be answered affirmatively by reference to several historical examples. The British Fabian Society, which at its height had only 4,000 members and for most of its history had under 1,000, 
Between 1884 and 1945, accomplished the complete transformation of England from a well, uh, from a, <laughs> from a liberal quasi-capitalist nation to a complete welfare state. The Fabians made no secret of their very pragmatic approach to action, based ne nevertheless on a consistent non-pragmatic ideology. Their basic method was not political, but rather precisely the type of lever point utilization described above. Historian Max Beer described the Fabian intention to operate not as a political group, but as a quote, as quote, a group of men and women who are endeavoring to spread practical views on the immediate, practical, <laughs> on the immediate and pressing social problems and to indicate the way for their embodiment in legislat legislation or administrative methods, end of quote. In their methods of operation, the Fabians were technocrats working within the scientific and intellectual community. Shaw's Fabian essays, quote, base socialism not on philosophical speculations, but on self-evident evolution of society. It accepted accredited economic science, whatever that might have been back then. Uh, it, it constructed the edifice of socialism on the firm foundations of existing political and social institutions. Fabian historian Anne Fremantle describes, describes as... Hmm, describes as the greatest Fabian achievement, quote, training the personnel who, through their knowledge of the new disciplines of, so, of the social sciences, could achieve the reforms all parties wished. The Fabian's primary tactic, tactical method was permeation, um, which is the placement of Fabians in lever points on commissions in the civil service, in newspapers, and in universities. Their detailed research reports on conditions in various segments of the English economy won them widespread recognition. Their concrete proposals as members of official advisory groups and commissions were not presented as socialist tracts, but were written as reasonable and practical proposals for solving specific problems. And that, that points out a lot of the tracts that are done on campus are very broad-based. They're libertarian um, tracks. They're about, what is libertarianism? And this poor kid comes along and says, what is libertarian and why am I interested in that? Whereas if it was a track on, on alternative institutions like uh, other schools, you know, free schools or something like that, he'd have an immediate interest in that because he's kind of sick of school or uh, health care. Do you? Go ahead. Uh -huh, but they never, they didn't stay in little rooms like this. They went out. So I think that's his point. Okay, the question is, how long do you want to wait? Is it right now? You, you heard about these reports. We're not, we're not in the 1885 the Fabian War. The Bulls are in the Fabian War, the Bulls are in the Fabian War, the Bulls are in the First of all, that's a, that's a really bad analogy because in the last century there was no mass communications, and uh, and you could get away with a long for a long time with uh, with deficiencies in society. Now, if you have uh, a enterprise set up in in the wrong way, you're going to have power crises, air traffic crises, which affect a broad thing. So. So our ability to um, propose solutions is much more enhanced just because they need the solutions that much more. Uh, no more. Okay. Um, despite, despite their low-keyed, soft-sell approach, the Fabians never forgot their ultimate goal. The, I don't know, maybe I should go back to that point. I don't know, where, how, how do you tell where we are? Uh, Atlas Shrugs been out for 10 years, and there's a, a really solid move in the last year or two. All right, well, let's sort of go back to uh, Chris Barnes down and off and not. Some of those were born in the 30s. That's the beginning. And they were very much involved in the Fabian movement. They were back well into the, just back to the time of the Industrial Revolution or the Capitalist Movement. But I mean, it was aborted at that time. But I mean, you know, what I'm trying to point out is that uh, when the faith was adopted for the tactic, a lot of groundwork was done in advance. Uh, the 
not be done by us before we can start by time. Well, for the for the people who are going in. What what have I been reading here? They're already doing without our help. They're right. And when he starts talking about the futurists, that's even more amazing because they're not just talking about how to make systems more more efficient, but uh, what systems should we have, which is called normative planning. Yeah. Some of them. Oh well, then you know. Um, once the government gets done, you know, stops, moves out of uh, mass transportation, someone has to provide that. Most likely, the corporation. I don't see where. The corporation is going to have any less problems with with, the, with their systems than with the government because they're just as bureaucratized. Um, although you know, I'm sure there there are some guys who who are going to worry about losing their job, but but that's a, just a, a possibility. Some will, some won't. I'd like to hold off on any questions at least until the end of the speech because we do have another speaker also. I don't want to go into this time. If I can avoid How much time do I have left? Okay, I got four more pages. I'll whip through those. And uh, okay, more recently, uh, another uh, an analogous group is Opus D D I. Do I pronounce that right? In Spain, uh, ostensibly a lay Catholic religious order founded in 1928, Opus Dia is a quote coherent and successful movement whose members have come to occupy over the last 12 years more and more key positions, uh, political, economic, and educational, in Spanish life. Although avowedly non-political, and they couldn't be, in Sp they couldn't be political in Spain, uh, the leadership has recognized the value of Libra points as being an extra political way of exerting a great deal of influence on the, the, the course of uh, the nation's development. And I really have to do this because uh, the only political group is the, uh, the fascist uh, Falang, I guess that's pronounced. And uh, he goes into some stuff, uh, some quotes from this thing. But essentially what he's saying is that, uh, that a very small group of people are, are changing Spain to some extent, and that they're all in the top positions now, and in a very soft way. They don't go running around calling themselves libertarians. They say... Uh, they say we might you know, try this kind of thing. So he recommends um, careers, the working in the think tanks. Now I don't know how that helps people who are still in college, but um, okay. He says it's a really good profession because they treat people as professional individuals rather than employees, and this. This is very much the case. Uh, it's practically a freelance situation in this kind of uh, in this kind of uh, business. It, es essentially, uh, it's salaried, but it is a freelance situation where the people are jumping every year or two from one job to another. And uh, and they're tolerant of unusual hours and dress and office decors and ideas, so long as you do competent work. And if competent work means uh, uh, recommending the free market as solutions to various things, I'm sure that uh, a lot of people here would get along there. Another avenue, avenue of influence, and this is what I'll get into after the speech, uh, is to join organizations which are likely to influence advisory commissions, either by providing members and staffs or by generating ideas and information for them to use. Such organizations fall into several categories. First, there are the professional societies, such as the Association for Computing Machinery, American Chemical Society, the Institute, the Institute for Electrical Machinery, the American Chemical Society, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, uh, SAE, and so forth and so on. 
Increasingly, these societies are becoming involved in soci socio-technical issues in which the role of government is often central. A relative handful of people in each society is generally given the task of exploring policy alternatives and suggesting to the society's governing body, uh, or rarely the entire membership, what position to take on various issues. It is not exceedingly difficult to get involved in such work because uh, there's not enough volunteers and, uh, and, they, and, and the officials want, are eager for people, especially younger people, to quote, get involved. Um, how much can be accomplished varies, right? But it's worth a try. Um, a particularly important professional society is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It gives an address, which is open to professions in virtually every field. Physical, biological, social science, economics, education, and medicine. Uh, the AAAS leaders are continuously being sought out to serve in advisory capacities on all levels of the federal government, and their study groups are formed for the same purposes. Another significant group is the World Future Society, another address. If anybody wants these, I guess they can look through this. A professional society whose membership is drawn primarily from think tanks, but which is open to anyone interested in discussing and exploring the shape of the future. I had their magazine, but I didn't bring it in. The World Future Society has been existence only since 1966, but already has attracted distinguished groups of members, supporters, and advisors. As books uh, such as Future Shock come to be more widely acknowledged, the role of futurism is likely to become increasingly significant uh, in the years ahead. Libertarians should be in the forefront of such organizations, aggressively, but, he says, dispassionately, presenting economic and socio-political analysis in whatever pragmatic method is acceptable, while in the background working to develop the basis for acceptance of a rational value system, which is what you were talking about. Um, and he has in parentheses, it is the futurists in particular who see the need for a rational system of values. And just about any books you, on the future you look into, they're always discussing um, not merely alternative futures, but the basis for choosing those. And finally, and here is his plug. Um, there is a, a further institution which can exert leverage out of proportion to its size, and that's Reason Magazine. Reason is conceived, and it's different from when I had it. I was just doing it for the fun of it, to, to appeal to libertarians, and they have a different marketing idea, which should come to fruit within about four years. Uh, Reason is conceived of an increasingly becoming an interface among professionals working at the lever points of our society, providing for interchange of information Development of theory, new methods of analysis, and assessment of solutions. Its job is also to support, to spot significant trends, locate promising solutions, uh, locate promising new lever points in terms of both job and membership opportunities, and to spotlight new and innovative products and services. And one of the things I might have gone into are these different reports, since they're, they're in reason anyway, so this article will appear. Um, at the same time to provide a libertarian employment exchange. Reason exists to foster the development of a new kind of, quote, movement. Not underground, but rather a community of permeators, technologists dedicated to rational, individual-oriented oriented social change. And the last sentence is, given a place to stand, perhaps we shall move the earth. 